Hi everyone, welcome back. This week I would like you to start off by having a little think about how this cupboard from the 1950s, 1960s is different to one that you might find today. What is in it and what's not there? Pause the video, have a think. So hopefully you have realised that we've got, for instance, a lot of glass bottles, we've got corrugated board uh, boxes and we've got some tins. What's not there? Plastic. So today we're going to learn about different types of plastics. We're going to learn about polymerization, identify stock forms, learn about the differences between common thermoplastics and consider some environmental impacts. Now we're going to talk about polymers before we talk about plastics because all plastics are polymers. Now polymers used to mean things like natural polymers, the things like horn, insect resin, also known as shellac, which is sometimes still used now, uh, glues, natural glues and waxes, things like beeswax for waterproofing. Others included uh, amber, tree resin and latex, which is a form of rubber. So these are all natural polymers. So polymers are non are non natural synthetic polymers that we make nowadays are are from, made from crude oil and coal. So they are carbon and hydrogen molecules joined together in different formations. These individual units are called monomers. So mono meaning one, and these form long chains together, becoming polymers. So poly meaning multiple. So from one to multiple, and this process is called polymerization, and that is why. Uh, all plastics are called polymers. We're going to get into why that's called plastics in a minute. So just as an overview on fractional distillation, which hopefully you'll be familiar with from your science lessons, is that all crude oil is extracted from the ground and taken to a refinery, to be heated by fractional distillation until separated into useful different parts called fractions. So here's our refinery on our little diagram. And it's all heated up. And uh, these are the different fractions. So at different temperatures, they produce different sort of liquid materials. And they, they uh, become less and less dense as you go up. So bitumen is the most dense. Uh, then you've got different types of oil and diesel, which is slightly less dense, all the way through to petroleum gas, which is obviously a gas. So the um, it starts at naphtha but also gasoline and petroleum gas. These are the fractions from which almost all plastics are made. So just to give you a better understanding, so if we go back to our refinery here, then in each of those towers, that is actually where the fractions are produced. So now we know how they're made, we should talk about why they're made. Well, plastics or polymers have replaced a lot of materials, things like glass, metal, tins, uh, and quite a lot of card as well in commercial production. And that's because they have some really useful properties. And the first being that they are easily molded. So you can heat them up and change them into all sorts of shapes. And that's why these particular types of polymers have been known as plastics because the term plastic is actually a real property, uh, which means that it's easily molded right into innovative shapes. So that's why these polymers are called plastics. They are also really lightweight. So if we think back to, for instance, a lot of those glass bottles, if you had a truck full of glass bottles, and you replace them with a truck full of plastic bottles, you'd be able to carry the same amount of volume, same amount of liquids, but much less costly. So you're actually you're reducing the amount of fuel that you have to burn and reducing the transportation costs. They're also very tough. So they uh, protect the product because they can take those impacts, those blows without cracking or breaking. They tend to be clear. You can make them clear if you want so that you can see the product inside. Very economical, easily available and cheap to make currently. And they are aesthetically useful. So you can colour them, uh, you can print onto them, you can do all sorts. But not just thinking about commercial production, but also for, for instance, medical uses, right? There's loads and loads of uses for plastics. But for instance, in the medical industry, um, we wouldn't be able to have, for instance, the NHS without the use of uh, disposables. So that's why they're really great. And just to take this one step further, we really want to think about plastics 
useful for products that are going to last a really long time, right? So parts of houses like windows and guttering, um, things that we can use at work, uh, compost bins, wheelie bins that are going to last for years, if not decades, glasses, which if you're wearing a pair of glasses, they're probably made of plastic, uh, even children's toys. And how about cars? Why not other things, right? They don't have to be made from metal. And actually, they, you'll be reducing the uh, fuel costs even further because plastic is so lightweight. There's loads of really useful uses for plastic. And to make them really useful, manufacturers often add special type of chemicals to change the properties. So we have two products here. Um, I have this kayak on the left and a camping chair on the right. Have a little think about where they're used and what makes them stand out. What kind of additives may have been included? Have a think. Okay, well, first of all, we can see that both of them are really colourful, right? So colourants, pigments are added to these plastics to make them aesthetically pleasing. Where are they going to be used, both of them? They're going to be used outdoors, right? A lot of plastics will get very brittle unless you have UV stabilisers added. Not quite like my little picture here. It's to stop the plastics from degrading, breaking down, becoming very brittle um, in the sunshine. Um, but also things like flame retardant. So this camping chair, if it was placed too close to a bonfire or maybe a smoke, someone was smoking a cigarette, if that caught onto the fabric, it would go up in an instant and less flame retardants are added. And plastics are available in all sorts of stock forms, i.e. how are they ready to be uh, sent out before they're produced into useful products. Well, so they're available in, for instance, different thicknesses of sheets. Uh, like, for instance, we have our HIPS sheets for vacuum forming at school, um, as films, perhaps, like vinyl film, uh, granules for powders, for injection moulding, rods and blocks. So let's get into thermoplastics. Now, as we said, they are long polymer chains with weak bonds. So heating can weaken these bonds, which allows them to be shaped, reshaped and recycled. So we're going to go through all of these examples in just a moment. Um, but just before we move on, um, of course, there's also the thermo setting plastics, which I go into more detail in my other video. Um, but these are not useful for packaging because they can't be heated and reshaped. They just burn. And if you're interested in what happens to recycling, I can highly recommend this short video from One Small Step. Uh, she has a, a whole series um, and it's absolutely fantastic. So give that one a watch. Right, so let's go through the common types of thermoplastic. Now, I've left up the material properties and the uses here um, so that you can copy some of these down and become familiar with them. Um, but we're just going to go through some of the outlines for now. So the numbers down the side are the ones that you will find on the underside or the bottom of a lot of common uh, pack, uh, packaging and products. And these codes indicate uh, the, uh, the co how commonly they tend to be recycled. So one and two being the most common, but actually PP is pretty common as well. So it tends to go down towards all the way down to other, which is the least commonly recycled. So PET stands for polyethylene terephthalate polyethylene terephthalate. Try and practice that one and learn that one three times fast. So this one's really strong and stiff and used for things like pop fizzy bottles. Next, we have HDPE, which is high density polyethylene. That's pretty strong, lightweight, things like milk jugs. They're, they're all HDPE. Next is PVC, which stands for polyvinyl chloride. And that's because it has a little chlorine um, chemical actually in with the, the carbon and hydrogen bonds. And uh, it's also known as vinyl. So, for instance, like vinyl records, but also vinyl stickers or vinyl decals. LDPE is uh, the little brother of HDPE because that's low density polyethylene. And that tends to be your classic shopping bags, your carrier bags. Um, but if you make it a little bit thicker, you can also make, for instance, flexible bottles from it. PP stands for polypropylene. Uh, that's very chemically resistant and it's used for loads of things, um, but or particularly things like um, like little flexible bottles, um, but also toys, because polypropylene has a really interesting property of being quite a soft sort of plastic. Um, it, has, it feels a bit different to other types. PS stands for polystyrene. 
Now we have two types. We have high impact polystyrene, also known as HIPS, and we also have expanded polystyrene. So they're very, very different considering they're both polystyrene. Uh, HIPS is cheap and rigid, um, uh, whereas expanded polystyrene, it's called expanded because it's literally injected with air, um, is very, uh, very, very lightweight. And that's for things like your insulated uh, coffee cups that you will be familiar with. Uh, and then last, we have number seven, which stands for other. Um, that includes loads of plastics, but we just need to be familiar with acrylic, nylon and polycarbonate. Uh, acrylic and polycarbonate for things like uh, car, he car headlights, uh, but also things like CDs. So now it's your turn. Um, I have left you the codes and there's a little picture down the side. And I'd like you to work out what, uh, you know, at least have a good guess about what each of these products are made from. So pause the video and have a think. OK, let's go through the answers. So first we have this medicine bottle, and that is most likely to be high impact polystyrene. Next, we have a vacuum formed tray and there are two, two main types of plastics which are vacuum formable. And those are hips, but also PVC tends to be PVC because it's food grade. Uh, next, we have this very clear, quite rigid material, and that's almost certainly going to be PET, just like our, our pop bottles. Down here, we have a, a shampoo bottle, and that's probably going to be HDPE. Next, we have a little squeezy sort of eyedropper bottle, and that's because it's kind of squeezy, kind of soft, it's almost certainly going to be polypropylene. Uh, next, we have our crisp packet bag. So it's very thin. It's a film. So it's probably going to be low density polyethylene. Next over here, we have a little sort of jar. It's actually going to be two parts. So we have the bottom part and the, the lid. So the bottom part is probably going to be clear acrylic. Uh, and then you've got polypropylene for the uh, lid. And then last but not least, uh, we have a clear sort of film that's going to go over the top. It could be an acetate um, or a PVC. It could also be a cellulose bioplastic. Now, I'm not going to get too much into too, into too much detail about bioplastics in this video because it's not enough time. But that is an amazing uh, new innovation. So you could look into that in your own time. So let's briefly discuss the impact of plastic. So, of course, they have changed, for better or worse, uh, the, cha the world that we live in. And there's positive, but also negative impacts of plastics. Right, so we've got the plastic revolution, everything made of plastic, you know, fantastic material. But, of course, uh, single-use plastics are now becoming, um, you know, a real problem for a lot of people and wildlife on this planet. This video goes into a lot more depth about it. Really good video. Uh, give this one a watch and you'd be surprised about which countries make the most plastic waste. Well, I'm hoping that video was a bit of an eye opener. And let's just briefly talk about some better ideas. So, you know, in terms of plastics, you've got to remember that only about 9% of all the plastic that's ever been made in this world has actually been recycled, which is a tiny, tiny amount. And of course, it's still cheaper for companies to make bottles and packaging from raw materials. So they just will. Right. It's, it makes sense for them. Makes economic sense. The properties um, change when plastic is recycled as well. So actually, a plastic bottle doesn't become another plastic bottle. Only about 10 percent of that original plastic bottle can be turned into other things. So what can we do instead? Well, for instance, we can limit single use plastics. Right. We could refuse. We could use what we have for as long as we can. So that's reducing, repairing and reusing. We could invest in reusable and compostable alternatives. Right. So rethinking our options instead. And of course, we could do things like join local eco groups, school groups. You could write to your local councils and MPs, raise awareness and try and make a difference there as well. If you'd like a really uh, visual recap of everything we've covered today, I can highly recommend this video. So in summary, natural polymers were originally derived from plants and animals, but nowadays synthetic or man-made polymers come from coal and oil by fractional distillation and polymerization. Additives offer useful properties. They're lightweight, easily molded and cheap. 
Stock forms include tubes, films, sheets and granules. We looked at some of the common thermoforming plastics, which have varying recyclability. And of course, the environmental impacts. We can think about these six R's. Thanks, guys, and catch you next time.